everybody to a word from the word broadcast. Uh, checking everything. Seems like everything's working. <laughs> so I want to come on here and spend about 15 minutes like I do every evening with you. Tomorrow night, I'll probably be on about 8 o'clock. So 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tomorrow's my last day off. So uh, tonight we'll continue our studies. We're on the doctrines of God. We're starting to be... Uh, Talking about this, teaching a little bit about the existence of God. I'm not going to regress or review. You can go back and watch on YouTube the nightly videos or the Facebook page, nightly videos, uh, and you can catch up. But tonight we want to look at talking about God, the unity of God, versus polytheism and dualism. And you say, well, what's them two big words mean? Well, I'll tell you what they mean in a minute but it's still going on today. Nothing's changed. And you'll see in just a few minutes. Let's pray together. It's been about 15 minutes. I'm going to go to a prayer meeting. And then, of course, we have our Psalms 134 prayer meeting. It starts about 9.30, goes to about 11. And um, so get in your prayer request. I'll, I'll put it on the, my Facebook page here in a little bit, or you can leave your prayer request in the comment section of my YouTube channel. At Clay Cordell, or here on this Facebook Live, or you can put it in on the comment section of my Facebook page. Father, bless, move, have your way. Holy Ghost, have your way. Save the sinner nearest to hell, Jesus, before it's everlasting too late. Bless your people wherever they are in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's look at this for a few minutes tonight, and then I'll be, uh, we'll be departing till tomorrow night, Lord willing, together. God's unity, the unity of God, versus polytheism and dualism. Now, uh, what polytheism means is a belief and worship in many gods. I mean, you go in countries today, they have many gods. Even in America, we have all these people running around worshiping false gods. And so we see that that's what polytheism means. Du dualism where you can, uh, and by the way, in the ancient world, there was never, uh, uh, never an atheistic country. In the ancient world, if you study history, not a country on the earth. Now, they were polytheistic. They believed in many gods, but they didn't deny God, God's existence. They were just led astray by the devil to believe in false gods. And now, Dualism teaches two supreme opposites, evil versus good. And that's how everything came into being, by these two powers. That's what dualism means. But God, the one true and living God, the only true God is the God of the Bible. He's one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so we want to kind of uh, just look at a few verses tonight. Uh, I've got several notes written down here. Uh, one fellow, I like what Preacher Carter said one time, a fellow came up and asked an old country man, country boy, uh, where did God come from? He said, well, I don't know because he's never been, he's, uh, he's never uh, been anywhere. Uh, he's always been here. <laughs> where did God come from he's always been here he hasn't never went anywhere <laughs> and so uh, I thought that was kind of neat so that's what dualism and polytheism means but we want to look at uh, at the God of the Bible and what does he have to say well we're going to read it out of the word of God Deut Deuteronomy 6.4 Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Not a plurality of pagan gods, but one true God. How about this verse? Isaiah, number two. Isaiah 44, verse six. But thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first I am the last, and besides me, there is no God. And he meant that. He meant that. 
when Israel came out of Egypt, all the surrounding nations were, even Egypt was serving many false gods. And God had to let the Jewish people know after he brought them out of Egypt through the power of the blood of the lamb and the plagues that he's one and nobody, no other gods exist. And they were to be a light to the world. Even Jesus taught there was one God. Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's unity. Je you say, well, Jesus was saying he was God. That's who he is. Uh, look at this verse right here, number three. <laughs> Isaiah 45, 5. There is no God beside me. I mean, that's not hard to understand. You don't have to be a Greek or Hebrew scholar to understand these three verses I've just read. God is quite clear. There is no other gods but him. You say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, the New Testament teaches that. 1 Corinthians 8, 4, there is none other God but one. The God of the Bible. So when we, tonight, we look at these verses tonight, we see that the God of the Bible is the one true and living God. Even the Jewish people twice a day pray the prayer of Deuteronomy 6, 4 that I read in your hearing. It is the central prayer of Judaism. It's the number one declaration of faith. And we need to let folks know that we serve the one true and living God. It is, it is the most powerful and most unifying statement that a Jewish person can make. And it's also the number one and most powerful unifying statement that a born-again Christian can make. There's one true and living God. God is one in three persons. We must be, in this day, the last of the last days, we must be strong in our faith and our deep loyalty to the, to the one Lord, the God of the Bible, to his word, the 66 books of the Bible, and to live according to his moral commandments. Loyalty. One scholar said that Deuteronomy 6, 4 is the Jewish Pledge of Allegiance accepting the authority of the kingship of God. They pray that prayer twice a day. They pray it when they first get up. They pray it when they go to sleep at night. Think about that tonight. They say the first prayer that a Jewish child is taught in the nation of Israel and their culture is there's one God, one true and living God. And then when they die, it's the last prayer they pray. That's loyal to the, to the one true and living God. Now watch this. We that are born again and saved, we should be more loyal than the Jewish people to the one true and living God. The Lord Jesus Christ. Even in their praying, they wrap the one true and living God around their uh, arms when they go into prayer uh, and with the prayer shawl on their head. Even... Uh, on their doorposts, they have a, a a thing they put on their doorpost that has this Deuteronomy 6, 4. There's one true and living God. They take this serious, folks. And we as born-again Christians should be way more serious than they are. It also means it's a declaration that God is all there is. There is no life without God. Nothing truly exists outside of God. Acts 17, 28, in him we live and move and have our being. In him, the one true and living Lord, the Lord Jesus, the Lord God. So what does the verse say? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Jesus himself affirmed and prayed this prayer. And he was the Savior of the world, the only Savior of the world. Mark 12, 28. And I'm going to read it to you and I'm done. Then one of the scribes, that's a lawyer in the Old Testament days, came having heard him, heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, he asked him, asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? 
Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, and he quotes this verse I've read in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And ye shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The Lord Jesus Christ said that. The Savior of the world. God Almighty in the human flesh. So I hope that you enjoyed the broadcast tonight. Uh, I'll be back on tomorrow night for another broadcast. Tomorrow night, we will be looking at it's been about 15 minutes. Sometimes it goes into 30. But, you know, it is what it is, huh? We're going to start looking at some of the God's attributes. God's attribute. An attribute, a quality or a property or a characteristic of God. So we're going to look at some of his basic, start looking at some of his basic attributes. And uh, so... Uh, have you a pen and a paper out. It's not going to be an extensive study. It's not going to be in-depth study. We're just briefly breezing through over just the basic uh, the definition of each one of these attributes, and we'll brag on God every night, probably for several weeks. Shout out to Pastor Carter of Rock Church in Emmon, where my wife and I attend, 299 Blackstock Road, Emmon, South Carolina. We're having a lot of people saved. We're having a lot of visitors. And uh, we're so thankful the Lord is moving in our midst. We have prayer meeting on Monday night, so we're going to be getting ready to roll here in about 15 minutes that way. Uh, like I've already told you about uh, Psalms 134 prayer meeting tonight, which me and Brother Richard and Brother David hold every night from 930 to 11 after everyone's gone. Now, I'll be coming on with a video about 9 o'clock, and you can leave your prayer request in the comment section of that video. And uh, so we hope you will. All right, Brother Mark, I will send you. Well, Brother Mark, I'll give it to you right now where you can have time because Mark works a job like myself. Let's look at the first attribute of God we'll be studying. Uh, Brother Mark, Psalms 90 verse 2 will be our verse for tomorrow evening. We're going to be talking about the etern eternality of God. God has no beginning or end. He's eternal. He didn't come from anywhere, but if he decided to come from somewhere, he's God. He'd come from wherever he wanted to. He doesn't have to answer all of our questions. <laughs> he's answered enough of our questions. And uh, so we just need to get saved. That's what we need to start doing. The greatest question you can ask is, what must I do to be saved? Dr. Jerry Falwell said that. So that is the greatest question. What must you do to be saved? You must repent and trust Christ alone for your salvation. You must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that he's God Almighty in the human flesh, that he was virgin born, Holy Ghost conceived. He lived a perfect life. He died a perfect death. He rose again from the dead on the third day, and he died on the cross for your sins and my sins. And if you trust Christ alone for your salvation, Jesus will come into your heart. And that's what the Bible calls being saved. Saved from the wrath of God and the eternal lake of fire. So we pray that you'll get saved before it's everlasting too late. And let us know if you do. Mark, did you get that scripture? <clears throat> Good to see people tuning in. Some of you have commented. Good to have you from different states. And uh, let's see if Mark's still on here. I might have to send it to him. Mark helps me every within. You can send me information on the verses if you want to send me a little bit. I'll do my best to incorporate your your studies into our lessons. All right. Well, that's my dad. Let me go. God bless you. God bless America. And God bless the Jewish people.